last year uh, for Christmas, I did a dramatic monologue um, of Mary uh, and the Christmas story. And uh, this morning, I'm going to be um, Hagar. Uh, and so our story from um, Genesis chapter 16. Um, but I'm going to ask that you actually don't take your Bibles out. Um, don't read along. Just um, take in the story. And, uh, you know, when you go home later this afternoon or sometime this week, take, take some time to read the story. It's in Genesis 16. Um, but for this morning, just, just experience what Hagar experienced. Um, now, just a little disclaimer here. Uh, you know, Genesis 16 only tells us so much about the actual details of what happened. Um, so I'm... I have a little bit of creative license. Um, everything I'm saying, you know, is not necessarily exactly how it happened. Um, but I did a lot of research, uh, a lot of background research, um, and did my best to, to kind of recreate um, what happened in order to communicate what scripture is trying to communicate in that chapter. Um, so I'm going to be Hagar, and uh, I'm going to pray for us this morning first mostly for myself because I'm freaking out right now. Um, <laughs> I'm going to uh, pray for us, and then um, when I'm done praying, uh, I will be Hagar. Father, thank you uh, for this morning, and I thank you for your word um, and just the power of story um, that you have communicated, what you have communicated to us. And I pray that you would open our hearts now to hear uh, what you have. Holy Spirit, come and be with us and in us and teach us, comfort us, challenge us um, through your word. And it's the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Have you ever felt invisible? completely and utterly alone. Like no one in the world could know your pain, even if they tried. Have you ever wondered, does anyone see me? Does anyone hear? Can anyone understand what I'm going through? I have. My name is Hagar. But no one ever calls me that. Instead, it's my servant, or your slave, or simply you. You know Sarai, Abram's wife? Of course you know Sarai. Everyone knows Sarai, but not like I do. You see, I am Sarai's slave. I am invisible. At least, I used to be. You see, it all started back in Egypt. I grew up a slave girl in Pharaoh's palace. The life, my life was grueling and fast-paced. I lived every moment in constant fear of doing something slightly wrong and being beaten for it. One day, a caravan arrived from the northern land of Canaan. There was a famine, and... They were looking for food to fill their aching stomach. Word soon spread that there was this beauty was beyond compare. Pharaoh, being couldn't live Pharaoh, decided that he couldn't live without her. And so I was herded along with a bunch of other slaves, camels, donkeys, and sheep to the tents of Abram and given in exchange for his sister, Sarai. There was just one little problem. You see, Sarai wasn't actually Abram's sister. She was Abram's wife. And when Pharaoh found out, he was furious. He dropped Sarai on our doorstep and drove us out of the land. I left everyone and everything I knew behind and went with Abram and Sarai to the hill country of Canaan. We've lived here ever since. 
different than Egypt. Nothing like the hustle and bustle of the palace. Quieter. But it's never quite felt like home. Then again, neither did Egypt. I became Sarai's personal slave. And I was intrigued by the lack of idols that cluttered the normal Egyptian home. I soon discovered that these strange people believed in a god named Yahweh and that he was the only god. This was absurd to me. I mean, in Egypt, we worshipped hundreds of gods. But according to them, there was only one god, and he was god over everything. He seemed to make a difference in the way that they lived. And Sarai treated me well. But this family had no children. And it became abundantly clear to me that Abram wanted a child and an heir more than anything else in the world. And Sarai was frustrated beyond belief at her inability to give him one. Me, I wanted her to get pregnant just for the peace of the household. But she was 65, and there was little hope on the horizon. Each month that passed swung her further into the well of depression, fear, and deep, deep shame. Abram tried to be patient, but with each month that passed, the lines of disappointment on his face grew deeper. One morning, Abram burst into the tent shouting, Sarai, Sarai, we're going to have a son. And before she could even respond, he had crushed her in his embrace. I faded into the background and listened as he told her what his God had told him. He had said that Abram would have a son and that his descendants would be as numerous as the stars, far too numerous to count. Could it be, I wonder? Sarah, Sarah could hardly believe her ears either. For the next few months, the air crackled with expectation. But, It seemed as if their God was playing a cruel, cruel joke. And in the months that followed, Sarai's shoulders began to droop again. And the lines on Abram's face returned. At some point, Sarai started acting a little strange. I didn't think much of it considering the circumstances. Maybe then I can have a son through her. The water jar I was carrying suddenly seemed ten times heavier. The weight of her words crushed me, and I... The rest of that night is a blur, but I remember lying in bed, my thoughts a tangled web of hurt and fear and hope. You see, Sarai had every right to give me to Abram. I was her property, and she could do whatever she wanted with me. I had also heard of other women doing similar things. I wanted to believe that this could be a good thing. I mean, my status would be elevated. I would become Abram's wife, and this was probably my only chance of bearing a child. The child would technically be Sarai's, but no one could stop me from secretly loving it and viewing it as my own. But I was also scared. You see, I had never been with a man, and Abram was over 80 years old. And what would this do to my relationship with Sarai and the other servants? 
I lay in bed tossing and turning, Sarai's words playing over and over again in my head. Did I really hear what I thought I heard? But honestly, it didn't matter what I thought. I would do as I was told, no more and no less. Several sleepless nights passed before Abram showed up at my tent. We were married, and before I knew it, I was pregnant. At first, we were all so excited, Abram especially. But then things started to get a little more complicated. I started to think pretty highly of myself. I mean, it had all been so easy. And I hoped that maybe since I had been able to do for Abram what Sarai never could, that maybe he would love me. Maybe then I would be worth something. I began to look down on Sarai. I mean, she was old and useless. She had said herself that God had closed her womb. And as my belly grew, my pride grew with it. And so did Sarai's jealousy. I was a constant reminder of her own failure. The pride and joy reflected in my face at being a new mother was mirrored by the bitterness in hers. I didn't intentionally mock her, at least, most of the time. But eventually, we could hardly stand to look at each other, much other. Our relationship was strained at best and hateful at worst. But we were Abram's wives. And so our only, wor- our only weapons were words and manipulation. And let me tell you, we wielded them well. And Abram... He did nothing to stop it. But one can only live this way for so long. And one morning, I I can't even remember, I had said something about the baby kicking, and before I knew it, Sarai was screaming at Abram, this is all your fault. I gave you my slave to bear you a son, and this is what I get for it? She treats me with contempt, and you do nothing about it. May Yahweh judge between me and you. I was stunned. I looked at Abram, pleading him with my eyes, just to look at me, just to see me. But several long moments passed before he looked straight at Sarai and said, Your slave is in your hand. Do whatever you want with her. And walked out. Do whatever you want with her? How could he be so passive? Sarai hated me. And panic gripped me. I was Sarai's slave again. And she could treat me however she wanted. Not to mention, all of my attempts to win Abram had completely and utterly failed. Sarai took full advantage of his permission. And the fear and jealousy and hatred that had been welling up in her for months erupted in her treatment of me. I couldn't believe that this was happening to me. But then again, maybe I could. Because, you know, I had been treated like an object my entire life. What had made me think that this time would be any different. You know what made it worse? Abram did nothing. He refused to protect me, and I was carrying his child. And I was powerless, completely powerless to do anything. Anything that is except run. 
At first, it was just a fleeting thought. I couldn't really run, could I? It was too risky, too dangerous. I owned nothing and had nowhere to go. But soon, I began to fear for the life of my child. I fled. I fled into the darkness that mirrored my own soul. At first, it was a rash decision full of passion and terror, but once I made it, I knew I could never turn back. I wanted to go home, but I didn't have a home. And so I fled in the direction of Egypt. The anger, fear, and hurt that coursed through my veins kept me going for a while. But soon, my pace began to slow. I was hungry, tired, pregnant and scared, filthy from the dust on the road and completely and utterly alone. My thoughts raced without rest. What in the world was I thinking? What would, what would Abram say if he saw me now? What, what would Sarah I mean, she'd probably laugh at me (laughs) and say it was what I deserved. Where was I going to go? What was I going to do? The only thing that kept me going was my baby. My precious baby. But it was Abram's baby, and I had stolen it. What if they came after me? What if they found me? What would happen then? After seven days, I finally collapsed, sobbing at a well. I had nowhere to go. And I had been there for several hours when I heard a voice. Hagar, servant of Sarai. I was shocked. This man knew my name, and he called me by it. Before I could say anything else, he asked, where have you come from, and where are you going? I didn't know what else to tell him, so I told him the truth. I'm running from my mistress, Sarai. I didn't tell him I didn't know where I was going. And he said, Go back to your mistress and submit to her. My heart began to pound in protest, but before I could say anything, he went on, and I will never forget what he said next. Your descendants will be too numerous to count. You are with child, and you will bear a son, and you will give him the name Ishmael. For Yahweh has heard of your misery. And he will be a wild donkey of a man, and his hand will be against everyone, and everyone's hand against him, and he will live in hostility with all his brothers. And like that, he was gone. I began to cry again, but this time, tears of joy. For the first time in my life, I had worth. El Roi, El Roi, you are the God who sees me. A messenger of Yahweh had come to me. Me, an Egyptian, a woman, a slave, worthless, faceless voiceless. And the the child in my womb was a boy. And he would grow up to be a wild donkey of a man. He would not be a slave like me. He would be free. But the man had told me to go back. Could I really go back? I knew now that my child would live. And if I went on, 
I would probably die. And then I realized that I could go back because I was no longer alone. El Roi was with me. He had heard my cries. He saw me and he had a plan for me. And so I returned to Sarai and Abram. Before I left, I named the well Bir Laharoi, well of the living God who sees me. This encounter changed my life. Oh, I still suffer. I am still nameless and I am still a slave. But then God's presence in my life, the knowledge that he sees and he hears me, makes all the difference in the world. In the midst of my suffering, I have been given a voice and a face. God may not take you out of your circumstances. He may even seem silent to you. But he is present in your suffering. He hears Ishmael. He sees el Roi. He calls you by name. He hears. He hears the weeping of your heart. He hears the words that you would never dare speak. The thoughts that occupy the dark corners of your mind. He hears your cry, desperate for deliverance. And your soft whisper of loneliness, fear, injustice. He hears. And he sees. He sees the brokenness of your heart. He sees your every circumstance. He sees every single tear you've cried and those you haven't let escape. He sees the bruises on your body and your soul. He sees. Two months ago, I gave birth to a beautiful baby boy. Abram named him Ishmael. And every time I say his name, I am reminded of God's faithfulness. His faithfulness to look upon someone as unworthy as me. Surely if God has compassion on someone like me, he has compassion on you. Surely he sees you. Have you ever felt invisible? Fear not. El Roi sees 